Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Pain Consultants USA podcast. Today, we are going to talk about some common hand issues. And we have uh, a guest with us, Dr. Rowan Michael, who is a board certified orthopedic surgeon uh, with a subspecialty in hand surgery. And uh, we're hoping to get some good information from Dr. Michael about uh, the common conditions we see causing hand pain and even maybe wrist and distal upper extremity pain. So Dr. Michael, thanks for coming in to, to hang with us for a bit. Um, maybe you can start by just telling everyone about kind of your training and how you got into hand surgeries and, and what that entails for us. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Thanks for having me on here guys. So um, basically, you know, went to four years of med school and then from there went on to do an uh, orthopedic surgery residency up in New Hampshire at Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, and that was a five-year program for me. Um, and then from there decided I wanted to do hand and upper extremity, which, you know, is, is kind of variable. I think now in recent times, a lot of people are trying to push from just doing solely hand and wrist, which is kind of the traditional hand fellowship into doing some shoulder and elbow, or you can go the micro surgery route. So I chose the shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, kind of trying to do as much of orthopedic upper extremity as I could. Um, so I went down to the university of Florida, um, for one extra year to do fellowship training down there. And that was kind of split between six months of shoulder, elbow stuff, six months of hand, um, micro type stuff. Uh, and then now I'm back in outside the Philadelphia area. Okay. Yeah. He practices at premier orthopedics outside Philadelphia. Um, and so when you say micro surgery, could you just kind of give us an overview of what, what you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, hand is covered by either orthopedic surgeons or plastic surgeons. There's some overlap there. And so the micro surgery side, um, is where kind of both of those areas meet. And so uh, if it's plastics surgeons covering it, we do more kind of like flap coverage. So people with big wounds that need soft tissue put over those areas, um, vessels being anastomos together. Um, and then when people lose digits and that kind of stuff, you know, putting those digits back on called replantation, all that stuff falls under microsurgery. Gotcha. Okay, cool. All right. Well, um, you know, one of the most common things that I see in my practice and probably most people who deal with hand pain at all see is carpal tunnel syndrome. I think that's a lot of people come in and tell you they have carpal tunnel syndrome. And, um, you know, it's something that we treat on a very regular basis. And I think many people treat it many different ways. What is your approach to the typical kind of someone comes in with a little bit of numbness in the first three fingers, it's been going on for a couple months. What, what's your approach to that? You're kind of, okay, what might be causing this? And then what, do, what are your first steps in maybe managing or diagnosing that? Sure. Um, so I guess that's a, the, the end of your question is a good point is that you kind of want to be sure when someone comes in complaining of those kinds of symptoms that seem like they could be carpal tunnel, you want to be sure that that's the definite diagnosis. There's a lot of stuff that kind of mimics it. Yeah. Um, and so typically I think you can make most of those diagnoses clinically. I don't know that you need to get a whole bunch of tests. Um, but I definitely send a lot of people for nerve studies and EMGs when there's any question of anything else. Um, so uh, just to real quick run through the other stuff that looks like carpal tunnel, but might not be right. So you can have neck issues that present as a pinch nerve in the neck that runs down your arm, causes similar symptoms. You also have the median nerve being compressed elsewhere. And I see actually a fair amount of that. I don't know if it's just, you know, coincidence or if it's that we probably miss it a lot and it happens more than you think, but I've seen a bunch of pronator syndrome, which is similar to carpal tunnel syndrome, but more proximal in the forearm. Uh, and I've done a bunch of surgery for that in the last two years too. So th that's what I try to make sure is this is definitely carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, and then from there, if I need a nerve study, I'll send them over to you guys for sure. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things where if you don't look for it, you never find it. So if people aren't looking for pronator syndrome, you're probably never going to see much pronator syndrome, but, um, yeah, it can definitely be tough. You know, I see people with carpal tunnel syndrome sometimes that really present with more like shoulder and neck pain than they do hand symptoms too. Do you, do you feel like you, you get those patients, you know, you, I try other things and then they're not working. I'm like, okay, well maybe it's something else. And then I find work my way down and I see, you know, maybe it's carpal tunnel syndrome. 
Yeah, I feel like there's people who present every which way, right? And they don't always follow the textbook. So a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome seems to run up the forearm and into the elbow instead of being the classic going down into the fingers. Um, and yeah, even people who complain of upper arm pain too. So yeah, yeah, in those cases, that's where I wouldn't hesitate to get the nerve studies and figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just for our listeners, like uh, clinically, how would you uh, differentiate the pronator syndrome? syndrome versus, you know, just a traditional kind of entrapment of the median nerve at the wrist. Yeah. So the, I mean, the first steps when they just come to me right before I have any tests or anything like that. Um, so I, like we said, pain in the upper forearm is, can be either one. And so the big tests are really right. Carpal tunnel syndrome. I think the three main tests that most hand surgeons use are Tenel, where we tap on the nerve and it should radiate into the, you know, the thumb index middle and maybe part of the ring. Um, a Phelan's sign, right? Where you keep the wrists flexed together uh, and see if you get those reproducible symptoms uh, or a Durkin compression test where we push on the nerve and you, that usually actually, you know, you have to wait 15 seconds or so and see the symptoms. But for the pronator syndrome, it has its own set of tests that are pretty reliable actually. So you can do something called a, a middle finger uh, FDS test where you have them uh, put their arm out supine in front of you and bend just the middle finger up and then you resist it. So resisted flexion of the FDS. And that seems to, because of the muscle belly of the FDS, compress the nerve and kind of create that proximal forearm pain. Um, and then there's a resisted pronation test where you have them flex their elbow 45 degrees and keep their forearm pronated while I try and resist them. And I tell them to keep fight me and keep the hand down. Um, and then also direct pressure right over the the nerve and the proximal form as it dives under the pronator. Those are probably the three big ones for pronator syndrome. Gotcha. And, and you uh, touched on it before, and, and I was more just curious with regards to getting these procedures or surgeries covered. Like you don't need to have a, a nerve conduction or EMG uh, test to prove carpal tunnel. I, I don't know how insurers, like how that works on your end. No. So actually, I mean, you know, Thankfully, I think most of the criteria are clinical in terms of making the diagnosis. I think even most textbooks would say that you don't need nerve studies uh, to prove carpal tunnel syndrome. I think if you're going to do something that, like like Bill said, if we we tend to miss more, like pronator syndrome, probably be better off getting it. But gotcha. um, and, and you you guys know right that nerve studies are often unreliable, right? You see very mild carpal tunnel syndrome with people who have terrible pain and horrible symptoms for over a year. Yeah. And then you see horrible carpal tunnel syndrome that's picked up incidentally. So I think we did yeah. a whole podcast <laughs> about that. Maybe one at one point. Yeah. We talk about that a lot. You know, it's very operator dependent. And a lot of times you find things that you're not looking for and you don't know how to correlate them with what they're feeling or if they're even, if they even matter at all, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think we're big, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of agree completely with, with what you say there, there, you, when you're, I always say when you're sending someone for EMG nerve conduction testing, you know, you got to say, I want to know if they have this exact problem and it's not, you know, okay, do they have that problem? Then it's not like, oh, they have some random problem that's completely away from that area that has nothing to do with anything. I don't, it does, that doesn't matter if there's no effect there. I want to know, do they have carpal tunnel syndrome? If they don't have carpal tunnel syndrome, well, if you're assessing the median nerve, is there some other issue with the median nerve? Fine, we can find that. But, but, you know, it has to have a very specific purpose. And sometimes you'll get as people who do EMGs will get referrals where it's just like, oh, they have some numbness every now and then in their legs or something. And you're just like, all right, well, I don't, I don't know, like clinically what, what else could it, what could it be? And then we'll focus in for something like that. So uh, yeah, it's like, is it a median nerve issue? Is it an ulnar nerve issue? You know, for patients, if it's a median nerve carpal tunnel issue, it should be thumb, index finger, middle finger, and then usually half of the ring finger and the ulnar nerve would usually do the pinky and the other half of the ring finger. That would be the most common thing to find. Those are two of the main nerves that go to the hand. The other one would be the radial nerve, which does more of the back of the hand. Um, and, and that's kind of the nerves that we're typically looking at in those studies. So, um, I and feel if, like, Oh, sorry. Bro. No, no, go ahead. No, I feel like sometimes in my practice, when I see patients with carpal tunnel and, and they might have it, you know, uh, on EMG as well. 
I'm trying to convince them to have surgery sometimes like, you know, they want to hold off or, you know, we might do an injection they might get a couple months relief, but I mean, they're young. It's like, you know, just go have the surgery. You go to a competent person, you're going to be just fine. Uh, I guess when you see patients who are kind of on the fence and if they do have an EMG, I mean, if it's mild to moderate and I guess in your eye, the symptoms kind of match up with that. I mean, what are you telling them? I, I mean, you know, compare like, okay. Uh, muscle strength is still good. There's no atrophy. You know, I, I guess, how do you kind of uh, manage that with patients who are kind of on the fence? Sure. Uh, I mean, I'll start, I should preface by saying I'm generally a pretty conservative surgeon, maybe just based on where I trained and my experiences and that kind of stuff. So I, I always tend to start with bracing with a few exceptions. Um, but to answer your question first, uh, I think I've probably gotten more aggressive specifically with carpal tunnel syndrome since I've been in practice because I tend to see a lot of people who have sat on it for too long. And, and what reliably gets better after you do a carpal tunnel release is pain and nighttime symptoms. So nighttime waking seems to get better pretty quickly and pain does. But if, if people have been sitting on it for too long, they often come back and they're still numb. And that's something I can't predict. Uh, but if I see a lot of the, you know, people who are elderly, like 75 plus who have been sitting on it for five years and those people, I'd say, you know, maybe 50% of the time come back and they're still numb for six months afterwards, or maybe even never get their full sensation back. So, so to your point, I think when I see people who are on the fence and seem to have, you know, slam dunk carpal tunnel syndrome with an EMG that proves it and all that stuff. I tell them, don't wait more than a year to get the, you know, if you want to sit on it for a while, you want to try bracing, you want to get an injection to be sure that you might respond to surgery. That's fine. But if you tend to sit on it for more than a year to the point where you've got persistent numbness, I tell them, you know, you're taking a risk that you might never get full sensation back. I think that's where us as people who sometimes do EMGs can be somewhat helpful. You know, we can differentiate on an EMG between the different injuries to the nerve. So sometimes if we say, look, the axons are damaged, we can see that the surgery is highly indicated because if you don't do it now, it's unlikely those axons will regenerate uh, later on. Whereas if it's more of like kind of a conduction block picture, then maybe they might be more likely to kind of get that back on their own over time. Um, and so if you're doing a really good EMG, a lot of times, maybe we can give you some more information that, that might be more useful to you. You might say, Hey, wait a little bit longer. So uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you get that typically, but, um, sometimes that's what a really good EMG can do is kind of be prognosticating what, what's going to happen here with different treatments. So. Yeah, I agree. I think it's like you guys said, it's, it's very hit or miss depending on who the, uh, you know, physician is that's doing the EMG and what their, the reports too can be kind of all over the place, depending on how they write it and that kind of stuff. But yeah, we, I'm lucky to have a guy in our group who does them and who's very good and, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. You, you mentioned uh, bracing. Obviously, I think that's, you know, where we all kind of start. Uh, commonly, you know, carpal tunnel kind of presents with nocturnal symptoms first in, in a lot of patients. So, um, wearing the wrist splints at night. I mean, what other, um, do you give them just nerve glide exercises? Will you refer them specifically to hand therapy? I mean, what else are common kind of first steps for you? Uh, I don't, not for carpal tunnel. I don't do a ton of nerve gliding stuff. I, I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm, I may be biased. I'm not a huge believer in at least for carpal tunnel that you can change it a whole lot because the excursion of the median nerve is not a ton. Um, for cubital tunnel, certainly, I think that's a place you can start if you're young and you, you know, you're not someone who wants to jump into surgery. But um, yeah, so unfortunately for carpal tunnel, it's basically bracing and NSAIDs to whatever effect you can get some tenosynovitis down maybe and some inflammation down and, and have a positive effect if they're young. Um, I don't use injections for treatment purposes. I usually use them for diagnostic purposes if, I, if they have multiple things going on and I wanna know how much relief would they get if I did a surgery for carpal tunnel release, right? Like if they have other nerve symptoms or other pain symptoms and I'm not sure, I'll do an injection in that scenario or they're young and I want to be sure that I can help them with a carpal tunnel release. Here, here's a question. And I, it's more for me because I'm curious. And there was, uh, I used to go to a lot of alt, like musculoskeletal ultrasound conferences and there's some big guys in, in our field on that. And 
lecturing about, you know, management of carpal tunnel and, and some like dynamic things they see under ultrasound. And uh, some would talk about in maybe younger patients, uh, pretty like consistent symptoms, but EMG, not overly impressive that they thought, or, or one mechanism they thought was kind of a, a little bit of friction buildup or almost like a, adhesions of the undersurface of the median nerve to the tendon itself. So things aren't gliding uh, smoothly uh, through the tunnel, even if under ultrasound, you know, the, the nerve's not swollen, it's not kinked. Um, uh, is that anything, I mean, is that something you've heard of? Is that something you see in surgery? Like when you open them up, will you passively uh, extend or uh, flex their digits? Do you look to see how the nerve's gliding at all? Um, it's something that's pretty hard to tell intraoperatively. Uh, I definitely see adhesions that can be a cause of recurrent carpal tunnel syndrome in someone who's had a prior release. That's, that, that's a big one. Uh, if the nerve scars to the underside, it, it's hard to tell. Um, but I have, you know, read about it, obviously, so adhesions to the subsheath, uh, mm -hmm. of the flexor retinaculum, um, the subsynovial tissue. Um, I, I just, it's so hard intraoperatively to make that assessment uh, unless the nerve is densely scarred to the, the flexor and aculum. And, and I only really see that in revision surgery. Gotcha. Yeah. Can you give us but a brief? See... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, can you give us like a brief overview of what the surgery entails, like you know, where the incision happens and then, and what you're doing in the surgery. So people understand, you know, what it is and why it maybe works. Sure. Um, well, so basically the carpal tunnel is a space in the wrist, uh, that's bordered superiorly, right? So, so closest to the skin, uh, by a tight ligament called the flexor retinaculum or transverse carpal ligament. And so basically, you know, there's, uh, nine tendons in the nerve that run through that space. And so for multiple reasons, right, the end result is that there's less space for the nerve as it passes through that. It can, there, there can be all kinds of stuff, you know, pregnancy, fluid shifts, tenosynovitis, inflammation, whatever it might be that results in that. Um, but so basically what the surgery does is takes pressure off the nerve by releasing that ligament. And I, I don't know if you guys want to get into it, but there's two kind of primary ways I think that most surgeons do carpal tunnel releases either open or endoscopically through the camera. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And is it mostly done endoscopically now? I think that's really surgeon dependent. You know, I thought right. based on where I trained, most people were doing it endoscopically, but then in practice coming back here, I think a lot of hand surgeons in the area still do a fair amount of opens and the advantage is, you know, I, I started offering it more and more as the advantage for opens is you can do them wide awake. Uh, and so I do my opens wide awake and my endoscopics through a, a twilight sedation, a Mac. Okay. Um, and so wide awake, what kind of anesthesia is a patient getting just like a local? Yep. Yeah, injection? exactly. This has kind of become like a, a very hot revolution in hand surgery recently, um, is wide awake local anesthesia with no tourniquet. Um, and so I do 1% Lido with Epi, uh, just into the surgical area. And it's kind of right on the palm here. So you go from the heel of the palm down here, uh, up to right around here, um, in line with the radial side of the ring finger. So this half of the ring finger. So the incision ends up being maybe slightly longer than the endoscopic incision. But the nice thing is for people who don't want the anesthetic, they have other comorbidities. They like the idea of being totally alert afterwards. It's a nice option for them. Yeah, that's. A, I think a lot of patients probably don't know that that option is really out there. You know, from my, from what I see from patients, you know, a lot of them are like, no, I'm not getting surgery. I'm not getting surgery. And it's like, well, what if you could do the surgery wide awake with a little local anesthesia? And it makes sense. It's pretty superficial. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to do it like that probably. So, um, uh, but there's probably still lots of people doing kind of full, are you taking them to like a surgery center for this or in the hospital? Uh, I still, yeah. So I still, even for wide awake. So actually I, interestingly, I do all my trigger fingers, almost all, unless the patient requests it, I do those wide awake too. Um, and so I still take everybody to the surgery center to do them. Yeah. I know a lot of surgeons, if, if people are worried about like, Oh, I don't want to go to a, 
a hospital or a surgery center right now, a lot of surgeons, when they have the right setup, are doing it in their office in a procedural suite. So something to just kind of alleviate people's fears. You know, you could go in and out in an office setting. And so. Yeah, I have seen that actually for trigger finger recently. Um, where I'm practicing, I saw somebody who had it done in the office. It was the first time I'd heard of it, but I, it made sense, you know? So that's great. That's great. The patients are getting more options like that, you know, and it's safer, yeah. obviously anesthesia has complications, uh, that come with it. Uh, so, uh, if it can be done safely, that's great. What's a typical say with open procedure recovery time, what do patients expect, uh, from that standpoint? Uh, yeah, so I, I usually tell people, uh, you know, the party line is three days, you can get back to most desk work and light duty. And two weeks, you can get back to almost anything, except for the one thing that seems to bother people is people who have to put a lot of pressure on this area, heal their palm. And so people who want to get back to things like CrossFit, um, or they work in construction or stuff like that, like working with vibrating equipment, that's a little longer, obviously. Uh, and those are kind of the outliers who might take more like four weeks to be able to get back to that stuff. But basically, yeah, three days for light work and two weeks for whatever else you want to do. Any concerns when you're doing the surgery? Like what should a, anything a patient should be worried about? Like, oh, I don't want to get this surgery because there might be this issue. Like you mentioned getting adhesions and having, having to maybe get the surgery again. Anything else like that that's commonly an, an adverse outcome or, or just an unwanted side effect of the surgery? Um, so something that happens really commonly is called pillar pain and that's very typical and, and is a kind of not even a complication just a, a normal side effect in many people uh, and that's pain kind of right here a little bit more towards the ulnar side uh, in the palm and that's one thing I'm kind of referring to when I say people who, who have to put pressure through their palm don't do that great initially that may be because of pillar pain it almost always resolves by three months and that's probably the most common symptom we talked about the numbness persisting a little bit that's something yeah. who people who have had it going on for a long time. And then the worst, worst possibility, which, you know, fingers crossed almost never happens nowadays when done by a fellowship trained hand surgeon, but there is a extra branch of the median nerve that gives you uh, all the function to these muscles of the thumb, the phenar muscles. So it's called the recurrent motor branch of the median nerve. And that can sometimes take off in a funny or anomalous uh, route. And if it does, and that gets damaged for any reason, then you end up with some loss of thumb motion. That's the worst case scenario. And every hand surgeon kind of like, that's their biggest fear in doing carpal tunnel releases. Yeah. That's kind of the main, main thing you're looking for. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so another kind of common uh, issue in the hand that we see, and you briefly mentioned it was trigger finger. So, um, could you uh, just give our listeners a little kind of uh, synopsis of what trigger finger is? I mean, I think everybody knows, okay, finger gets stuck, you know, it's trigger in there, but where do you see it most common? What causes it? Sure. Um, so yeah, most common digits are the middle and ring. It can happen in any finger, but middle and ring seem to be just from the way we use our hands. And really, I, I, I tell patients the way to think about it is it's it's like a tendonitis, really, right? So, uh, you know, we call it a tenosynovitis before it's actually triggering. And then when it triggers, we call it trigger finger. But basically, the tendons of the fingers and thumb run in a sheet. They run into a tunnel that helps them work more efficiently and glide and gives them some nutrition, right? And so uh, if those tendons are normal size, they slide in and out of that tunnel, no problem. But if they get inflamed for any reason and they get a little swelling on them, then they start to stick and they can even eventually that tendon can get stuck completely. And that's when, you know, so when the tendon slides out of the sheath, when you bend your finger down and now you have a big lump on it down here, it doesn't want to slide back into the sheath as you try to straighten. That's what trigger finger is essentially. And so I have a tough time with conservatively managing this issue. I would say, um, I don't, I don't have too many options. Uh, sometimes I have people splint it for a while under the assumption that if they stop kind of the movement, it'll kind of decrease the inflammation of the tendon. It's worked here and there. It doesn't work other times, you know, then an injection. And then it's like, if you want it fixed, you go get surgery. I, I don't, do you have other thoughts about that? Is that kind of what you do? Do you even splint? Yeah, agreed. I actually, I generally advise against splinting for the most part, just because uh, I, I think if it's under supervision, you have people who are monitoring it, that's fine. But I see a lot of people who come in who have been splinting it because they don't want to use it and it's painful. 
And then they end up with a flexion contracture at their PIP joint. And that's hard to fix even after you do this or the release. So I, I'm not a big splinter, but um, yeah, I tell people two injections. And then after two injections, if it's still coming back after that, it's not worth, you know, futzing around with other stuff just to do the surgery. Right. 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 Now, can you talk about how that is different from another fairly common problem called, I, I don't know how to pronounce this, du, Dupuytren's contraction, contracture? Yeah, sure. Uh, Dupuytren's people, Dupuytren's. <laughs> it's funny. I, I, I don't even wrong. have cable, but yeah. uh, like now I, I see so many patients coming in telling me that they've seen the John Elway commercials. I guess he's a big spokesperson for Zyaflex now, but I, I don't have cable. Oh, oh, I, don't I haven't seen that. Uh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I don't have cable either, actually. So. <laughs> Yeah, I got patients coming in all the time asking about the. That's John so Elway. funny how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's that's a good question because they do a lot of even you know my MAs and stuff will mix them up because they they can present similarly. So the big thing to remember is Dupuytren's is hereditary, and it's a fixed problem, right? So it's not dynamic. Once you start to get a contracture in Dupuytren's, uh, it's stuck that way, and you can based on changing the position of certain joints can maybe straighten out the other joints. But ten, uh, trigger finger, sorry, is a dynamic problem. So if you just kept your finger straight the whole time, you wouldn't have an issue, right? Kind of to Chris's point before. Uh, but if you are using the finger, that's when you have the issue of it getting stuck as it slides in and out of the sheath. Um, and Dupuytren's has its own set of treatments that are different to trigger finger. Got it. Okay. Okay. So where would you go with that? Typically, are you, uh, splinting people for that or what are you doing for Dupuytren's? Unfortunately, there's really nothing. No one's ever shown that there's anything you can do to slow the progression of Dupuytren's, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's a, it's a systemic hereditary issue. It's not something that's happening just in the hand. Right. It can happen on the soles of your feet, uh, base of the penis, uh, and like anywhere you have that type of fascia. Um, and so, I don't do anything conservatively really for Dupuytren's when right. people's contractures get bad enough. And there's two different types. So some people just have nodules. That's the nodular form of Dupuytren's in their palm. Not much to do about that. Um, and then the cord like form is the one that I most commonly end up operating on. Okay. Um, and there's gotcha. three main treatments for it, which I can, you know, I'm happy to run through quickly. Um, sure. Yeah. Give us an overview. Great. Sure. So the, the, the ranging from least invasive to most invasive, the three main things. The first one is collagenase. That's the, the thing Elway is a big spokesperson for now. It's called okay. Zyaflex is the brand. Um, and it works. You know, I did plenty of Zyaflex in residency and fellowship, but basically it's a collagenase that doesn't discriminate against any form of collagen. And so it does have risks. It, it very commonly causes skin tears. And what happens to you inject the cord that's causing the contracture, inject that with collagenase. Two days later, they come back to the office and you pop it open. But it's probably also dissolved some of the collagen in the basement membrane, in the skin. Uh, there are reports of the flexor tendons rupturing. I, I've never seen it, but there are reports of that happening because it, like I said, it dissolves everything that's made of collagen if you inject it into that space. So I don't even do it. It's not covered by insurance. Uh, it's very expensive. And so I think you have to go to a center that kind of does enough of them that it makes it worth it for them to carry it and they can do it safely. Right. That's option one. Yeah. Option two is uh, under local only. You can use a needle for people who have mostly disease in the palm, not on the finger and the contracture is not too bad. You know, they're not stuck all the way down in their palm. You can numb up some spots and use the tip of the needle to break up the cord. And they're wide awake for that too. So they can tell you, oh, I felt a little shock there, maybe back off in that area. And that works great for mild disease. And the last option is a big open surgery where we go in and open the whole finger and palm up. The benefit of that is we can look right at the nerves, move them out of the side and, and kind of protect them and then take out that cord that's causing the finger to stick down. Okay. And then what is the, uh, what's the surgical intervention for a trigger finger? Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward, but just to differentiate there. Yeah. I mean, that's almost much more simple, just like carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's a, a little incision right here, right over where most people have pain. Uh, and basically what I do is the way to think of it is enlarging the tunnel at the entrance to the tunnel where the tendon slides in and out of, it's called an A1 pulley release. Uh, and then I also kind of trim down some of the swelling on the tendon itself, but that's just like carpal tunnel. I tell people three days, you can get back to doing pretty much most light stuff, a heavy lifting by two weeks usually. And are you just basically opening up the A1 pulley, like just incising it so that it's wide open? And then is, does it ever scar back together and it triggers again or? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, all these things can come back. Yeah. Uh, usually the rate of recurrence is is 10 years plus out for both carpal tunnel and recurrent trigger fingers. Usually I've obviously seen, you know, an, anomalies that come back within a year and that kind of stuff. But the nice thing about doing that wide awake, which is how I do most of my triggers, is I can have the patient open and close their hand in surgery and I can ask them, you know, do you feel it sticking? I can put my finger right on it and feel if it's catching anywhere. And then we can decide to do more or, or, or stop there, you know, to release more stuff. Is there a lot of post-operative pain involved in these surgeries? So carpal tunnel trigger finger, not really. I, I don't even give people narcotics, just Tylenol, ibuprofen. And, and I'd say 95% of people are fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Upatrin's bigger surgery. Um, and, you know, obviously some of the other stuff I do, just a radius fractures and, um, you know, even to queer veins can be a little bit more painful initially. So that stuff I, I give some pain meds for. For sure. Yeah, that was going to be my next question, probably the next most common thing, uh, you know, we see it within the hand in our type of practices would be uh, decur veins. Um, I mean, you know, what we're taught in residency is now this condition does well with bracing, maybe an injection. I, I don't know uh, your thoughts on that versus uh, surgical intervention. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Like I said, I, I am very conservative in general and maybe have gotten less conservative <laughs> since being in practice a little bit. Um, the, the nice thing about decor veins is that of all the surgeries I do, it might be the most, uh, the biggest, most drastic change for patients and one of the most successful, you know, carpal tunnel syndrome does well, generally trigger fingers typically do well, but people seem to notice a huge difference like day two or three out from decor veins because they were so unhappy before and so much pain. And then the turnaround is very quick. So I've gotten kind of maybe, maybe a little more aggressive with decor range just because I've seen that turnaround and people do so well. So when you're in there, um, you just want to just say what it is first. So oh, just I, go, no, go ahead, Chris, you can say it. I mean, I just want to, just so people know, cause people might not know that name. People might just have thumb or wrist pain, you know, and they don't know what they're talking about. So, yeah, I mean, no. I could go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're, so we're talking about, uh, let's see, I guess kind of tough to see here, but the first extensor uh, compartment of the wrist, um, tendons that help the thumb to come up. Uh, there's two tendons there, oftentimes kind of get almost like a tendonitis or tenosynovitis kind of inflammation around the tendon. Uh, and the test, you know, the Finkelstein test. So you put your thumb in your palm, grab your thumb, and then kind of put your wrist down. And a lot of people have pain kind of right on that radial side of the wrist. Um, uh, you know, usually see a kind of overuse activities and it's just a, you know, like a chronic tendon, uh, like a wear and tear type thing. Um, so within the surgery itself, uh, do you just debride the tendon or what, uh, as long as there's not tears, obviously, like what? It's actually, it's almost like the trigger finger of the wrist. I kind of just release the sheet of the first dorsal compartment. Um, and one thing you mentioned, right, the two tendons, sometimes in people who don't respond well to injections, I've noticed a lot of those have separate sheets for, mm -hmm. uh, for the APL and EPB, the two tendons that run in that first dorsal compartment. And so you just have to make sure you release both tendons fully. Um, but yeah, I do a pretty limited tenosynovectomy, you know, if there is really obvious inflammation around those tendons, but I think it's really the release that makes the difference. That's interesting. Yeah, we'll do like injections under ultrasound and look for that, like the two compartments and, and, you know, just make sure it's within the sheath, but. Sure. Yeah. Uh, actually, here's a question for you guys, actually, because I'm interested in this. This is more for my education. You know, maybe we're not very good at ultrasound, but orthopedists tend to use it kind of uh, randomly in the office, but is it pretty sensitive? You guys feel like when you're well-trained on ultrasound, you can pretty reliably see stuff like that down to the level of two separate compartments. Uh, oh yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. Especially sharing. something like that. Yeah. 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 Like He's, my, my father-in-law uh, had this problem and uh, he was bugging me about it for months. And I like, I told him to go to hand therapy and he was doing some therapy and then he was here and he was like, yeah, it's gotten better, but it's still bothering me. And he's here and I'm like, all right, I'll take a look at it. I'll take a look at it. So finally, after a few days, I took a look at it with the ultrasound. I brought my ultrasound home. I took a look at it. 
it was 50% bigger than the one on the other side. The, the sheath was a Demetis. It was just like very obvious. Like I was like, Oh, this is, you know, your, your tendon is swollen and it's terrible. So I gave him an injection and he had a hundred percent relief and it went away and never came back. And uh, you know, it's like, it's, it's very, some of it is very obvious to see. And same thing, you can very clearly see the sheath around the tendon. You can very clearly see if there's, you know, separate sheaths and things. So it, especially on something that's so superficial on ultrasound, it's like kind of very easy to visualize. And, and especially if you have kind of some of the smaller probes, you can really kind of get like a very large picture of what's happening. Chris, I don't, you, Chris, Chris is a big ultrasound guy too. So, um, you know. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's great for that type of hand stuff. Uh, I use it a lot in my carpal tunnels where we'll look at like dynamic movement. We'll look to see, you know, is there proximal swelling, uh, kind of distal swelling, does it kind of, uh, uh narrow through the tunnel. And, um, and those patients, if I see some of those changes and they're on the fence, I like to show it to them. Listen, you know, nerves being compressed. Um, you know, I, I think it's a better idea for you to go. If we don't see the actual compression, and you know, to my eye, it looks like it's not gliding nicely as I have them dynamically move. That's when I'll do an injection, but I'll make sure it's kind of almost like a hydro dissection. Like everything goes underneath the nerve on top of like the, the tendon uh, sheets and they seem to do well, you know, for, for the time. So, but yeah, ultrasound's pretty cool in that regard. So do you, did you get some in like fellow? It's like you said, you get some in fellowship, but it's like, obviously you have other things going on. Yeah, I actually, I even went to a, a ultrasound course uh, offered by the Hand Society one year in fellowship, um, which was incredibly useful. But I think it's one of those things where you, if you're not doing it regularly and keeping up with it, you kind of lose it quickly. Um, yeah. But there are people who are incredibly proficient. One uh, female surgeon from France was showing us how she does most of her carpal tunnel releases in the office under ultrasound only, um, which is, is you know, kind of scares me. But I guess if you get good enough, you can, you can do yeah. stuff like that. Uh, I don't want to rile your feathers, but there is a, uh, there, I there's some PMR. Go here. I knew you were well, going to no, no, go no. here. <laughs> I, I, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm uh, just, you know, he's, he's mentioning that. And I, I there were some PMR people that uh, I think were over in France and like, you know, did some procedures with, I think someone like that, but um, Jay Smith out of Mayo, he's a PMR guy, um, pretty well known in, in at least our field. He's, kind of created a, a device and there are there's there's people doing even like interventional radiologists too but they're doing carpal tunnel releases under ultrasound they do take longer than the open they take about a half hour okay but um it's it's interesting the device that was created but it's yeah you know i, I don't know it, 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 they started with it maybe five years ago haven't really seen it you know expand too much but there's it's, it's interesting, you know, the argument maybe back then was, oh, you could do it in the office, no anesthesia, but now you're saying you could do the same thing with no, no anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. In the office too, almost. So that's yep. pretty cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you're ever looking for a good ultrasound, uh, AIUM used to put on a really good one. Uh, but now like anything you see Jay Smith or uh, Finoff out of Mayo, if you're have time to burn and credits you need yeah those are cool courses usually yeah and i think the key is like you said like it, it having it available and just taking it out like every patient who comes in just take it out and take a look you know every little look you take it helps because then like you just recognize things you know where to find structures you know how to find them really easily how to identify the different types of structures and things it just becomes like second nature to you you know um, well you, you have the unique perspective because you know what <laughs> that's our only glimpse to the yeah, inside you, exactly. you know what the insides look like uh, uh when you're in there so that's pretty cool yeah yeah it's a little different Yep. I, uh, I, I want to pick your brain just a little bit um, on something that I see quite a bit um, referred from one of my local hand surgeons, but it's uh, complex regional pain syndrome, usually after trauma to the hand, um, whether crush or um, amputation, like traumatic amputation, or even unfortunately some nerve injuries as a, a, a consequence of a surgery. Um, so just for kind of our listeners, complex regional pain syndrome, there's two types, used to be called reflex sympathetic dystrophy or RSD. 
So one type is where uh, oftentimes brought on by an injury in the upper extremity or lower, uh, it could even be like an ankle sprain and then you, know, you get pain out of proportion, not healing, limb could swell, change colors, really sensitive to touch, um, extremely painful. And then the, the type two would be where a, a nerve is actually severed or injured for some reason. And then you get the sequelae of uh, severe pain, swelling, discoloration, temperature changes in the limb. Um, I was just curious uh, in your practice, I mean, how common uh, is it uh, that you may see something like this after trauma? And if you do, I mean, what are your kind of initial steps? Because unfortunately, CRPS is often misdiagnosed or missed a lot of the time because it is pretty rare. And, you know, the studies do show if you catch it earlier and you try to start treatment on it earlier, the better chance for a, a more positive outcome long term. So, sure. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those things that I think we all uh, kind of dread when it when it comes in because it's such a tough thing to fix. But um, that, I guess one, there's a whole spectrum of kind of pain syndromes, I think, you know, from probably full-blown CRPS uh, at one end to hypersensitivity, hypesthesia, maybe small fiber nerve damage, you know, early on. And like you said, you know, I see it even after just regular surgery, a lot of times, it's much more common in females, that's well known. So that kind of four to one incidence, females to males, um, middle age, uh, and there's a bunch of risk factors. But like you said, True CRPS, much more common after kind of big trauma, high energy injury, crush injury specifically. Um, and it's not when, you know, just the, for whoever's listening to this, when we say nerve damage, you know, the nerve damage in CRPS is often these tiny, tiny little nerves, right? The small fiber nerves. We're not talking about uh, the median nerve or the radial nerve or nerves we can find and decompress. That does happen, but much less common than the other type. So if, if you have a clinical suspicion uh, of it in a patient, I mean, is, um, will you refer to either uh, pain management or neurology or physiatry, or um, are there certain things you'll do uh, initially, whether get them to your hand therapist and do desensitization, uh, uh, that kind of thing? Yeah, I usually try and help them initially first and just see, uh, you know, some people have done fairly well coming out of it. Um, and I do think maybe more often than not, I don't know if I can back this up, but I think it, it does resolve with time if you do the right things and are willing to wait it out in most people. Um, so I start with uh, showing them desensitization exercises, different kinds of stimuli, and I encourage them not to protect it too much. I'm not a big fan of splinting CRPS for a long time. I want them to move it. I want them to kind of aggravate that area so that the nerve fibers can learn what normal stimuli is like. And then I'll, I'll send them to hand therapy right away too, after I show them that stuff, just so that they can stay on top of those kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, for anybody that knows someone that's had it or, you know, has had it themselves, yeah, extremely painful. Um, and, you know, the, the frustrating thing sometimes is there's no true diagnostic test. It's a clinical test. You know, years ago, we used to think a triple phase bone scan was useful. It's pretty specific, but not sensitive. So, you know, if you have, if it's positive, okay, it helps us, but if it's negative, it doesn't mean you don't have it. Um, so yeah, it's a, uh, it's always good to, you know, have the, the suspicion, you know, high or you know, part of this podcast, we like to just kind of give patients tips to kind of look out for themselves. Cause you know, sometimes depending on where you go, you know, sometimes the, the care may not always be the best. So, you know, if, if after trauma or, you know, you're, you're noticing you know, weird swelling and, you know, we're months down the road and surgeons saying everything should be good or whoever you're seeing and, you know, extremely painful, even to touch, uh, things are swollen, different color temperature changes to the other hand or leg, you know, uh, might be reasonable to at least get another opinion. Sure. Yeah. I feel like it's one that I hear about sometimes where, yeah, I see a patient, you know, they're five years down the line. They're like, yeah, it was so weird. My foot was swollen and it was red and it was cold. And you're like, oh yeah, it's CRPS, but you just, no one ever told you, or you didn't know it. Um, but that's, you had this condition, you know, I had someone the other day that was just like that. They were like, yeah, I don't know. They messed up the surgery. And I was like, no, they didn't mess up the surgery. You had a bad, re <laughs> had a bad response to whatever was being done. And, and, uh, and, and you had this condition and, you know, it's an unfortunate condition to get, obviously, as, as we all know, um, you don't want to have that, but 
Is, is there even like an incidence of that just post-op complication even in your guys literature at all or is it that rare that it you don't even um i don't i couldn't quote it off hand in terms of the uh the incidence of it um there is there has kind of been like a a little bit of a push recently within the hand uh kind of world some people believe that almost all crps i'm not sure i buy in this but that almost all crps is related to at least in the hand uh, to some kind of nerve compression that can be helped at least. So, you know, some people are saying that if you have CRPS that you can usually treat it by either doing a carpal tunnel release, or if you have a superficial radial nerve issue, decompressing that, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know that I truly, you know, believe that all CRPS is related to a nerve compression, but, um, that's something that in the hand at least has started to gain some traction. I'm with you on that one. I've seen some, I've seen some people come back and they just keep getting surgery after surgery. <laughs> Try to decompress every nerve in the arm. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. Do a 360 nerve release on it. <laughs> it would just keep so working our way up surgery. proximal. Yeah. Yeah. But one thing I do tell my patients, if it is suspected and, and, you know, they do have to have surgery or, or they're, you know, in these trauma uh, cases where you might have multiple surgeries planned, um, uh, I'll tell patients, or at least in my referral or consult note, you know, talk with anesthesia, you know, some perioperative ketamine is, is always a good idea um, as well in these patients, at least helps with some, you know, or the theoretical the chance of helping with a little better post-op uh, pain control too. So, um, yeah, it, also, in the hand world for a long time, there was a thought that vitamin C uh, around the time of wrist injuries, specifically mm -hmm. the radius fractures, high dose of vitamin C, uh, so you know, 500 milligrams a day for 50 days would decrease the, the rate of CRPS. I think some people still do it. I, I think it's kind of fallen out of favor that the studies haven't borne that out over time. Um, but I guess, you know, the risk of taking too much vitamin C is pretty low. It's a water soluble vitamin. So some people still do it. Yeah. What, um, is there anything uh, that's really cool, exciting, cutting edge, uh, within your field that, you know, is, is being worked on, or you think we'll hear more about over the next couple of years that we should keep an eye out for? Uh, I mean, I think people are always trying to extend surgery, especially in orthopedics, because it's such an implant heavy and, and, uh, industry driven, uh, field of medicine that there's always kind of cool new things happening. You know, there's everything from nanoscopes now that you can actually scope a wrist in the office uh, under just local um, that's being developed or is actually already in, in process. Um, the wide awake, so called Wayland surgery, wide awake local anesthetic, no tourniquet is a big kind of revolution in hand surgery. I think people are going to see that more and more. People are pushing the limits of what can be done wide awake. Um, and then there's experimental stuff to, uh, you know, people are trying experimenting with endoscopic cubital tunnel releases, which is, you know, the people call their funny bone up at the elbow. It's the ulnar nerve. Um, people are trying to do that endoscopically too. Um, and so there's all kinds of stuff we might see coming along. Um, I think, like I said, industry and, and all the research and money that's poured into orthopedics tends to drive things forward to some degree. Some of it's, you know, just whatever companies pushing their stuff, but some of it really does change uh, the way we do things. One thing that I use in my practice a lot, not, not paid by any company. So I can say this without, without having to disclose anything, but there's a, a elbow implant. There's a, um, for bad, what's called terrible triad injuries, bad fracture dislocations of the elbow. They're called terrible triads for a reason. They do miserably. They're every hand surgeon used to hate them, uh, treating them because they come back either dislocated or they never move again. Um, there's recently been something that was developed uh, that is a hinged internal fixator. So it's actually something that you put uh, inside, fixed to the olecranon, fixed to the lateral epicondyle, and it has a hinge that is under the skin. And so the elbow can't really physically dislocate while that's in place. So you can start moving people if you wanted to day one after a terrible triad injury. That's kind of changed my practice. So I've kind of started taking on a lot of the elbow stuff in my area uh, and using that device. Nice. Very cool. That's pretty cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming on and talking with us. And, um, you know, maybe we'll talk about some elbow stuff sometime in the future, because I'm sure you got a lot to say about that as uh, evidenced by the last minute or two, but, uh, we really appreciate it and, uh, keep doing some great work out there. All right. And, uh, we'll, uh, talk to everybody next time. Thanks. All right.